Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto the stage your host for tonight, Mr. Richard Birchnell. Thank you. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary celebration. In the late 1960s, 50 years ago, amidst cultural, spiritual, technological and scientific advancements, an ordinary young man from Switzerland took the world stage and challenged the very understanding of our past. His highly controversial and rather mind-bending theories about the gods who came from the skies with a promise to return in the future rippled through the fabric of our reality, gently shifting and turning the wheels of time. Tonight, that very same ordinary man is here to revisit his first memories of the future as he reminds us of the most monumental and influential speeches of the past five decades. Would you please give an extraordinary warm welcome to a luminary whose pioneering body of work has shaped and redefined ancient astronauts' theory, Mr. Eric von Daniken. Among this audience are some colleagues, some writers, I hear of some critics, including some scientists. For me, it's a great honor and a joy to speak to you. And now, came to the theme. It's a long, long time ago. Nobody knows how long, but at least 6,000 years. In the past, when gigantic spaceships revolved around the old Earth. How, for heaven's sake, would somebody know this? We know it from the old literature, especially from the old Indian literature. Many texts in antiquity describe in detail these spaceships. Of course, they had no words like spaceships at that time. They called it cities in heaven. And of a sudden, three of these vehicles flew around the Earth. And from these gigantic spaceships, smaller vehicles came down. The old Indians called them Vimanas. One of our ancestors, one of the human, his name was Arjuna, was taken up to the cities on the firmament. He learned the language of the extraterrestrials, and he was an eyewitness of a war in heaven. Three cities came together, and two of them were finally destroyed. Arjuna, when he came back to Earth, he described what happened to him. The cities on the firmament looked like different bulls, one bull next to the other. He himself was brought up by a smaller vehicle, a so-called Vimana. Arjuna even gives the name of his pilot. The pilot names was Matali. And they came up to these gigantic spaceships. And Arjuna realized sooner or later that these beings up there, by the way, he never calls them God, that these beings up there had different opinions. They had some fights. They were not of one, all of one mind. So he described a war in heaven. Two of the cities were destroyed. For the earthlings, it looks as if gigantic, smaller falling stars came to our planet. All this is described in detail in the fifth book of the Mahabharata, which is part of the old Indian mythology. A war in heaven? Is this all imagination? No, the details are too precise and they are linked together with other traditions from other old books around the world. But the war in heaven? What is heaven? A place of happiness after death? A place where we are united with God? 
But even in our Christian and Jewish tradition, it all started with the war in heaven. Do you remember maybe the story of the archangel Lucifer? He went to the throne of the Almighty God and said, we don't serve you anymore. Then God ordered the archangel Michael, Michael to fight against Lucifer and to throw him out and his disciples out of heaven. But ladies and gentlemen, when I was a boy, I learned that uh, if I live a correct life, if I don't cheat and lie to the people, if I don't become a murderer, if I was a honest people, after that I would come to heaven. And heaven is the place of absolute happiness because in heaven we are united with the Almighty God. But in such a situation, if heaven is the place of the Almighty God and happiness, an opposition, a war, is impossible. When you are completely heavy, happy, you have no war. You make no opposition. I suggest we must change the word heaven into the word space. Why? Because many of our ancestors were brought into the heavens. Not only Arjuna from the Indian mythology, but also the biblical Eliah. Enoch, I came to him later. Even our primogenitor Abraham. All these figures were educated in heaven. And then they returned safe to earth. So heaven was space. The same is true for words like angels. What is an angel? In cave and rock chiselings, the angels are shown with the helmets or halos around their head. In religion, angels are the messengers from heaven. They can fly, they are shown with wings. But these angels were not only loving creatures, messengers. There are falling angels. I come to that later. Some of these angels fight against humans. They had even sex with humans. Spiritual beings have no sex. We should change the word angel into extraterrestrial. Now, only change 10 words of the old beliefs, of the old religions, 10 words of the old texts into modern terms. And the result is a complete new interpretation. In the second book of the Kings, of the Bible, chapter 19, there we read that an angel of the Lord killed, killed 185,000 Assyrians. The same story is handed down on a temple wall in Edfu. So on one side in the Bible, on the other side of all Egyptian writings. And we have chiselings and paintings where we see Azura Mazda coming down from heaven, in reality from space, destroying some of the humans. 185,000 Assyrians were killed by an angel just like this. But not the real war. The humans had absolutely no chance. These angels were the helpers of some so-called gods. In reality, there are no gods. There's only one god. But our ancestors described extraterrestrials and they believed that these extraterrestrials are gods. The same story or similar story is handed down in the Bible, which you can easily control in the book of Ezekiel. Now, I show you first now five pictures out of an old Bible. The Bible is 180 years old. Just to give you an impression what our forefathers had in mind when they read the text, the biblical text of Ezekiel. And after this, I explain you how we came to the modern interpretation of Ezekiel. And finally, I show you a computer animation to explain you what Ezekiel really saw some thousands of years ago. And this is something absolutely sensational. We have to understand that Ezekiel, by profession, he was a high priest in the temple of Jerusalem. In his time, 
Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians. And Ezekiel belonged to the high society as a high priest. He was captured too. They were slaves for the Babylonians. They had to work on the river. The name of the river was Chebar. And while they are working on this river, something incredible happens. Ezekiel describes that up from the sky, they saw an object. The object comes down. Finally, it comes to a standstill. Ezekiel describes the whole object as the splendorness of the highest. Now be careful. When you read the British Bible or even German Bible, you always read the splendorness of God. I am familiar with the original text of Ezekiel and the word God never appears in the original text of Ezekiel. It just says the highest, whatever, but not God. In our translation, it is said God. So the whole vehicle he describes as the splendorness of the highest. He sees some creatures, and these creatures have four wings. And he describes the four wings made a terrible noise. It was the wings. They blow up sand. And next to the four creatures with the four wings, he saw a wheel. And now Ezekiel cannot understand what is going on because wheel in his times go forward and backward. But the wheel he sees here goes forward, backward, at the same time, right and left, without making a steering movement. You see, when you are sitting in your car and you are sitting and driving on your wheel, so the front wheels are turning. You can make a curve. Ezekiel describes a wheel which goes forward, backward, left and right, without even making a steering movement. Finally, he describes the legs. He clearly says the legs were made out of metal, and so on and so on. I have no time to repeat the whole Ezekiel now. It was roughly uh, 30 years ago when I had a secret speech in Huntsville in the United States on the, with the highest officers of NASA. Secret because we both parties, NASA and I, we agreed not to say anything about this speak in the public. At this speak, I was also speaking about Ezekiel, five minutes. And after it, we had dinner together. The highest NASA chief of construction came to me, and Mr. Joe Blumerich, and he said, Eric, that was very interesting. But in the Bible, you will never find technology. These are visions, dreams, but definitely not technology. He even said, I never read Ezekiel, but now because of your speech, I will do it in the next weeks. Joseph Blumerich spoke three languages, so he took three different Bibles in different languages and started to read Ezekiel. Finally, he get astonished because Ezekiel was describing things which the NASA people, the engineers, had on their desk that day. It was all before the moon landing. And every detail which Ezekiel described was already calculable and reachable. So Joseph Blumrich took Ezekiel by word phrase by phrase. He wanted to know what is this thing which Ezekiel described the splendorness of the highest. Only the object they wanted to reconstruct. And this was the result. Now this is not the spaceship with which you could move from star to star. There must be a mother spaceship somewhere in orbit and out of the mother spaceship this small vehicle comes down. Ezekiel calls it the splendorness of the highest. On top of it, he saw something glittering. It was just the pilot's place. He describes the wheels which could go in every direction. He describes the wings which made a terrible noise. He even described when the wings stood still, they were hanging down. Soon as the noise started again, and he compares the noise with the thundering of a waterfall, then the wings went up again. When the wings left up from the, from, from the earth, the, the wheels were left up too. Of course, when, when a helicopter is lifted up, the wheels, the wheels are not staying on the ground. He comes into every detail concerning Ezekiel. At NASA, they reconstructed a new wheel. They separated the wheel from the wheel central axis into different segments. 
Now each segment has an own axis, an own axle. Of course, with this wheel, you can go forward and backward, but you could move also towards you or away from you. With this wheel, you never make a steering movement. The wheel is always blocked. You can go in every direction, forward, backward, left and right, without moving the wheel. By the way, NASA has in the meantime a patent for this wheel, that the whole idea comes out of the Bible. <laughs> if you are a descendant of Ezekiel, you should maybe look for money. <laughs> now, when you read Ezekiel carefully, and I hope you will do this in the next days, you will realize that he describes the splendorness of the highest from chapter 1 to chapter 39. And then in chapter 40, something different appears. In chapter 40, he says that the splendorness of the highest came again. So a second time. And this time, the hand of the Lord picked him up and brought him on a very, very high mountain. He doesn't know where they go. He has no name of the mountain. He say, on a very, very high mountain. And underneath, Ezekiel saw something like a, a small or a big village or a small city. And in the center of the city, something like a big building, he describes like a temple. So this splendorness of the highest came to a standstill inside the building, which means the building can have no roofs. And then another being in glittering suits came to Ezekiel and says first, you humans, you have eyes to see, but you see nothing. You have ears to hear, but you hear nothing. And of a sudden, this glittering figure has something like a measuring device in his hands and orders Ezekiel to measure the whole building. And Ezekiel, in the meantime, he understands that this is not God. This is not an angel. So as he has courage. He asks back, why? Why should I measure this building? And the stranger says, that's the reason why we brought you up here. So Ezekiel starts to measure length and large and every detail, read it in the Bible. In the book of Ezekiel, you have pages, pages of measurements of this building. In Germany, there is an engineer, his name is Hans Herbert Bayer, and he wanted to know, are these measurings correct concerning the building? Is this a building or is it just fantasy, imagination? And he took exactly the measuring dates from the Bible, from Ezekiel, and started to recalculate and to redesign. One day, I didn't know him personally at that time, that's some 30 years ago, I had a thick yellow letter on my desk with different technical drawings and with the letter of this man. And he said, I measured the building and the building definitely was existing and this is how it looked like. I was absolutely fascinated. And I said, have you ever heard something of the work of NASA? What they did in the United States? The German engineer had no idea of what the Americans did. So I brought the two engineer groups together. And the splendorness of the highest fit exactly in detail into the reconstruction of the building. The building was never a temple. The building was simply, how to say, this, this a space station on Earth. Now, at this point, we have to say a few words about the Bible. I have consulted more than 100, imagine, more than 100 specialists concerning the Old Testament, translators, brilliant persons about Ezekiel. And there are so many different opinions what Ezekiel has seen. He was a dreamer. He was a, a, a fantast. He was all kind of things. But none of them, of course, says it was reality. In theology, they believe that Ezekiel had a vision of God. He saw the almighty God sitting on a throne, on a throne wagon, on a chariot, like chariots of the gods. But as I said before, in the original Ezekiel, the word God never appears. He always called it the highest and the splendorness of, of the highest. Ezekiel says, they brought me to a very, very high mountain and there were a temple. 
Now in theology, they say Ezekiel is talking about a future temple in the future Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, there are no high mountains. And Ezekiel, he would have known Jerusalem. He would have given the name of Jerusalem. In the original text of Ezekiel, the word Jerusalem, Jerusalem never shows up. It shows up in some translations, but not in the original. Now you must know all these texts here were written in all to, uh, uh, so many languages. And there are no, uh, there are no, uh, uh, there are only consonants, so S, Y, N, D, etc. So in, in the grammatical version of Ezekiel, the original, there is no future in, in grammatic. There is only present. Now the theologians believe that Ezekiel had a vision of a future temple in a future Jerusalem. So when you read the Ezekiel text, it's all translated in the future. So you read, for example, and there will be a temple in the very high mountain. And the temple will have such longitude. He will be so large. It's all future. But the original is present. In the original, Ezekiel does not say there will be a temple. There is a temple. There is a building. There is like this. That's the original Hebrew language. Now, what did Ezekiel really saw? More than 2,700 years ago. This is our opinion, what we think. The man is captured, he's a slave with some others on the river of Cheba. And uh, they hear noise from the sky. Up around the earth is a mother spaceship and a smaller vehicle comes out. In old India, these smaller vehicles are called Vimanas. Now, they hear the noise. The group of men look up there and they see an object coming closer and closer and the noise become bigger. Ezekiel describes the noise with the thundering of a waterfall. It must be very, very noisy. The sand is blowing out. And they are all afraid. He is a high priest by profession. Of course, he believes that he has to change the glory to see the Lord. So they all fell on the ground. And then Ezekiel realized this is not the Lord. This is not God. And he starts to describe in every detail what he sees. The wheels, the noise, the wings. He realizes that the wheels can go forward and backward and right and left without making a steering movement. He describes this wheel four times in his book. Then he himself is taken up, probably by an automatic arm, and he's seated to, next to the pilot, so the co-pilot seat. Ezekiel doesn't know where they go, but he feels the starting, because he says, the hand of the Lord pressed, up, pressed upon my chest. They bring him to a very, very high mountain. He doesn't know where, they, where it is. And underneath, of a sudden, he sees something like a, a little, city or a, a big village and there is a gigantic building translated as the temple. I suggest that the, the pilot would have told to Ezekiel, hey human, don't be afraid, nothing will happen to you, observe what is going on with you. And Ezekiel is a good describer, a good observer. He describes really what he's feeling worse in there. Now the splendors of the highest came to a standstill over the so-called temple. And finally, the splendor of the highest sink slowly into the so-called temple. And at this moment, Ezekiel realized that the noise of the wings this time is double as loud as before in the desert, because now the echo comes back from the walls. The vehicle comes to a standstill, the noise stops, Ezekiel gets out. And there is a strange figure in glittering clothes. And this strange figure, a figure first says, oh, humans, you humans have ears to hear, but you hear nothing. You have eyes to see, but you see nothing. And then, of a sudden, he has a measuring device in his hands, and he orders Ezekiel 
to measure the whole building. And Ezekiel has the courage to ask back, why? Why should I do this? And the other one answers, well, that's the reason why we brought you here. Now, why? Why should extraterrestrials from thousands of years ago observe a society, in this case, the society of slaves working outside, they came down, they just pick one of them up, they realize which one is the leader. They bring him to a high mountain, they order him to measure the building, they bring him back to his own people. Why? Ezekiel asked one, the other one, why, why should I measure the building? And the other said, that's the reason why we brought you here. The extraterrestrials knew immediately that the society at that time, the time of Ezekiel, had no technology. We had no aircrafts, we had no radios, nothing of our technology today. They knew exactly that they, the earthlings, believed that they, the extraterrestrials, were gods. They looked at them as gods. Now they take one of them, a high priest. He must measure the building. They bring him back because they believe it is all God. Such a trip such uh, will go into the holy writings. Ezekiel will write it down. What happened to him? And it passes from generation to gener generation. Even if the humans have war, if the front just changed during thousands of years, the holy writings will not change. They knew exactly what was going on in the future. Ezekiel asked the glittering man, why should I measure this building? And the other said, that's the reason why we brought you here. The, we, the generation of the future, we are addressed. We should look on these holy writings and we should start to ask questions. What's wrong here? We still may believe, deeply believe in God as I do. I never lost my God. But we should realize in the future that this was not God. This was technology. Wheels, noise, legs, blowing sand. And now we should ask questions. Questions like, was there maybe a higher civilization before? Or uh, have we been visited by beings from outer space? If yes, what is the proof? Have they just disappeared like this? Just gone? and left nothing behind it. The reason why he should do this was our generation, and not only in Ezekiel. I have different texts with different other cultures. Now, one of the other witness, definitely a brilliant man, is Enoch. You probably never heard from Enoch. Enoch is, in the Bible, just mentioned with two phrases. It says, Enoch was the seventh patriarch before the great flood, and even Enoch was the first human who disappeared in the fiery chariot from the earth. That's all what you read in the Bible. So how do we know something about uh, Enoch? Some 160 years ago, a British man came to Ethiopia, and he went into a convent. He stood there for 30 years in a convent. He learned the language per perfectly, the local language. And in the old library, he found a book, the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch was written down in the first person. I version, I did, an eyewitness story. He knew the name of Enoch from the Bible. He knew Enoch was the one who disappeared as first one in the fiery chariot. And now a book of Enoch. So he translated finally the book of Enoch from this Ethiopian language into English. And in the year 1900, 1900, a German professor translated finally Enoch from the English language into German language. Now, if you uh, want to look for a book of Enoch, you cannot just go to the library and say, I want the book of Enoch. At least in German language, the book of Enoch is part of thick volumes of scientific literature. The apoph apocryphic texts of the Old Testament. In volume two, you find 126 pages of the book of Enoch. Why is Enoch so fascinating? He begins the story, he says, I was 12 years old. The community, my village, we all wanted to sleep. And then we hear the noise in the sky. And something was coming down from the sky. Then two beings in glittering clothes 
came near to us. We were all afraid and we all fell to the ground, even Enoch. And of a sudden, somebody took him up and put him on his legs and said to him, don't be afraid, human, don't be afraid. We won't harm you. Now here we have the first questions. Why should extraterrestrials speak the language of Enoch? Some thousands of years, a group of extraterrestrials surrounded the planet. Some groups of them came to Earth. They behaved themselves as today's ethnologists would do. They studied some of the humans. Today's ethnologists or ethnologists hundred years in the past, they went to the upper Amazon River or they went to the upper Nile and there were complete different cultures up there, the natives. None of the cultures speak German or English or Spanish or French. It was never a problem for the ethnologists to learn the language of the nature in a short time. Language was never a problem. So when I suggest extraterrestrials, they behave themselves like ethnologists. It was no problem for them to observe a group and to learn the language. So for me, it's normal that the extraterrestrials uses the language of Enoch and says, don't be afraid, human, we won't harm you. Then they ask him, the 12 year old boy, if you wish, you can come with us. We will teach you. Ezekiel, uh, uh, Enoch, his courage, he said, yes, yes. They took these two strange, they took uh, Enoch with them. One of them says, human, you stink terribly. <laughs> so Enoch had to put away all his clothes until he was completely naked. And then they put him into the water. There must have been a, a river there or a creek. And when he comes out of the water, one of the two gives him a cream and orders him to put this cream all over his body, including his face and his hairs. Enoch does so, and then he smells on his skin. And he say, well, I smelled like ambrosia and different perfumes, which we have no translation of it. He's still naked, the boy. One of them gives them a, a, a cloth, of something glittering like they have. They teach him how to put the trousers on. And Enoch looks down on his own body and says, now look, I look like one of them. Then they go up there. Of course, Enoch has no word of spaceship. He sees up on the earth something like gigantic crystals. Doors open and close automatically. He understands nothing. He comes into different rooms. Finally, he comes to a round central room. And there, there is a throne. And on the throne, there is the highest. And the highest stands up and shake hand with the young Enoch from Earth. What I just told you, ladies and gentlemen, is fact in the book of Enoch, but not the way I told it to you. Why not? Enoch was translated for the first time roughly 150 years ago. The professors at that time who made these translations were brilliant personalities. Everyone was not a, a, a liar. It was not the question of, of hiding something. But in their time, the spirit of time was completely different. They knew nothing about flying machines, not to speak about spacecraft, space vehicles, space. They all believed in honesty. It must have to do something with God. So the translation of Enoch was made in a religious, psychological way. What I just explained to you before in my words, in the real book of Enoch, it sounds like this. Two angels came down from heaven. They uh, put Enoch into the water. They baptized him before the great flood. Forget it. They say, you stink. In reality, they give him a cream. And in the official Enoch book, they say, now uh, he is, uh, was heißt das? Gesalbt, I don't know the word. It doesn't matter, to a priest. But in reality, he was simply disinfected. That was all. Then he, re he received something which is a similar stra a garment as these extraterrestrials have. That's why he looks as him. I, I look like, like them. Of course, in the religion tradition, in the, the old tradition, they believe that now he went up to heaven. In reality, he was just in a smaller space craft. We would call it space shuttle up to the mother spaceship. Then he comes in the big ra uh, round room where the throne is, the religious translation says, and now 
Enoch is standing for the, old, for the throne of the Almighty God. But even the translators, some 150 years ago, they realized that something must be wrong here. If Enoch would have stand before the throne of the Almighty God, God would certainly never have stand up and shake hand to the humans. Forget it. It was all misunderstanding, simply because the time was different when these translations were made. In the meantime, we have the possibility to translate these things from a modern point of view, and it all makes sense. Enoch is, by the way, the only one who gives the names. I know, ladies and gentlemen, the names of these extraterrestrials. Well, I know them from Enoch. Enoch quotes them all. These are the names of their leaders. The name of the first is Jekun. He is the one who seduced the children of men, etc. 36 names. I said they behave themselves like ethnologists. Now, Enoch realizes that up there, they were of different opinions. And some of the group went to Earth, and on Earth they found beautiful humans, mostly female, male, but not only. And some of these guys wanted to have sex with us. And they did it, they had sex. Now the question comes up, why should extraterrestrials have the same sexual apparatus as we? I came back to this point, why this happened. So Enoch describes exactly what happened. You can read it in the book of Enoch. But when the sons of the heavens saw that the daughters of men were fair, they admired them and desired to mate with them. And they said to each other, we will take them as wives. Altogether, they were 200, which descended upon Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. Jared is the father of Enoch. Jared is the sixth patriarch before the great flood. Now you say, fallen angels or sons of heaven had sex with humans? This must be a wish, imagination. I suggest you just read the Bible. First book of Moses, chapter 6, verse 1. When the humans began to multiply and have daughters, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they took them as their wives. Which sons of God? There were no angels. All this was simply extraterrestrials. And we can prove it in other holy texts. And why they should have sex with humans, I came back to this. I have done my job now since more than 60 years. And of course, I have uh, collected an increasing mass of material. I just show you shortly a few things these are cave paintings. This is the Valca Monica. Valca Monica is near the border from Switzerland to Italy. This here is at the Hopi Indians. The Hopi Indians live in Arizona in the United States. There are walls full of Hopi paintings. This is in a complete different place. This is in Nazca, Peru. You remember the lines of Nazca? I will come back to them too. If you fly over Nazca, you see this 29 meter high figure. One arm is bending towards heaven, the other arm towards the earth. Even in of official archaeology, they call this figure El Astronauta, the astronaut. In Peru, they even have made figures chiseled and painted into the mountains in a way that you can see them only from the air. Look here, you see nothing directly. In practice, it looks like this. But you must fly. Otherwise, you cannot see this. Now, this continues worldwide. In the Sahara Desert, we have gigantic buildings, look like uh, paintings, look like helmets. One of the arms here with some sort of bracelets on it. This figure in the original is six meter high. It was discovered in 1951 by a French archaeologist. Now, why do I show you just cave paintings from over the world? This is Australia. The gods are the ones with the rays, the glittering rays, the helmets. The question, why did our ancestor worldwide 
separated in different continents represent their gods or their heavenly beings in a similar way. They had no contact together. This is Australia, Kimberley Ranch. There were no flying machines. There were no tourists. There were no ships going from one place to the other. I mean, the people in the Sahara Desert, in today's Algeria, or the one in North America had no contact. So why do they represent their gods in the same way? And later in evolution, humans learned how to chisel the gods. There is one city called Tulum. Tulum is on the Caribbean lake in Mexico. The whole city is dedicated to the descending gods. In archaeology, they call them bees, but this has nothing to do with the bee. You see, there are two legs, spread legs. They're always the wings, the arms, and the hands manipulating some control. In reality, it looks like this. But the reality is, you see the wings? Often the chiselings fell up or were kicked off since the thousands of years. Another one, I like this one especially, he has even shoes on. Again, the wings falling down from heaven. In originally, it looks like this. It's all destroyed here, the wings, but you still can see the shoes, the legs, and so on. Hopi Indians have made different forms of gods. In many of the museums in Central America, also in North America, you find these figures with helmets. And you ask the local archaeologists, what is it? Well, it's always los dioses, the gods. What kind of dioses, what kind of gods? Nobody knows, just the gods. Far away from the United States or from South America, Japan, the Japanese Stone Age people, they made these figures. They are called dogus. They were high figures, holly figures, but the Japanese Stone Age people had no idea of glasses. So what did they copy? Why? This one is really descending from the sky. He has a helmet on here. In modern terms, you can even see a micro before his lips. His hands are bending down, out, the, the feet up. This is in Villa Hermosa. Villa Hermosa is in Mexico. The Hopi Indians in Arizona, USA, they represent their kachinas. The kachinas were the teachers from heaven in forms of paintings, like here, but also in form of figures. When you go one day to Arizona, in USA, there is a museum of the Hopi, and in the museum there's a shopping center, of course, and then you can buy these figures, and you find the scientific literature, and there are different of these figures, and you ask them, what is it? They all say it's kachinas. And what, please, is a kachina? The kachinas were the descending beings from the sky who teached our ancestors thousands of years ago. And they told them, we will return in the far future. And in order not to forget the visit of the kachinas, they still make them today. At him, they make every year still this festivity. Now we had the Hopi Indians with their Kachina dolls in North America. We have this one in South America in the upper Amazon River. We have the Doku figures in Japan. This is all living mythology. And there are more examples. And they had no contact together. I mean, we have to be careful and to ask us what was going on there. This is not imagination. This is living mythology. And this continues, of course, and I have good arguments to defend my point. In Mexico is a city, a Maya city with the name of Palenque. In Palenque are different pyramids. This one is called the Temple of Inscription because up here, archeologists discovered 816 inscriptions. That's why they call it Temple of Inscription. It was in 1949 when Professor Dr. Rutz discovered up here a groove and they started to chisel out inside, they found a stairway going down. But at that time in 1949, it was all covered with stones. It took three years before they were under the, great, under the pyramid. 
and there was a, 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 a door in the form of a triangle that was opened abruptly. Of course, there was no gate at that time. That's for the, against the tourists. And they locked into a room. The room had was nine meters long, four meters large, and seven meters high. And there was a tomb, and the tomb was covered with a large tombstone, large three meter eighty to two meter twenty, one block. And on this tombstone, an incredible chiseling. I published this first time in Chariots of the Gods. I just give you now my, my version, and then I explain you what archaeology sees. There is something like a, a, a cover all over it, a frame. In the center, this man is sitting, bending forward, almost like a rising motorcyclist. You see, he has his nose on some sort of oxygen mask. He uses his two hands, the upper hand, the lower hand, to manipulate some control. He's sitting on a chair. The heel of his left foot is on a kind of pedal. He separates the chair, and outside of this uh, apparatus, you see something like a linking flame. Now, in archaeology, of course, they have complete different explanation. They said what I suggested is all nonsense. There is a writing around it, you will see it later, and the little part of this writing was translated. And it was absolutely clear, this here is Pakal. Pakal was the second last ruler of the city of Palenque. And Pakal, so the archaeologist, she said that he's sitting on a sacrificial altar. And this here, you know, the frame up here and the frame there, looking like this. This is the open mouth of a mythological monster. This here and this. This is the upper T's and the lower T's. So Pakal is sitting between the two T's. He's falling into the earth, eaten by this mythological monster. And out of his body we see the tree of life or the cross of life. What I hear explained as an exhaust in the eyes of archaeology, it's nothing else than the stylized hairs of the beard of the weather god. So this goes on and on and it all makes no sense. In the meantime, we learned to translate the writing around this. The best translators of Maya writings are the two professors, David and George Stewart, from the University of Texas in Austin. Father and son, that's why they have the same name, Stewart. And they are the best epigraphs, and they translated this text now a few years ago. And he said, yes, it is Pakal, but all this is not the open mouth of a monster. This has nothing to do with cross of life or tree of life or with stylized hairs of the beard of the weather god. Every little detail has to do with the cosmos, with the universe. Pascal is, fly, Pascal is flying away from the planet Earth. That's the most modern interpretation and translation. On the third tablet of the temple of inscription, Stuart and Stuart found date, dates in connection with this Pascal. The date shows the year 1,247,650 year back in time. Another date says Pakal will return to Earth in 4,114 years, measured from that time. Now, also I'm accused since Chariots of the Gods that I present this picture in a false way. You're not allowed to look at it crossways. You have to look at it lengthways. This looks like this here. Now, I am a man with imagination, and if I have to look at it lengthways and not crossways, my fantasy goes over with me. I give you an example. We are here now in Mexico. We jump to Asia. In Asia is this gigantic temple. In Java is called the Borobudur. The Borobudur is composed of many stupas. Stupas, for us, they look like a bell. These things here. Now, the stupas in Buddhism has different uh, explanations, 14 different explanations. One of the explanations of the stupa is the stupa is the small vehicle in which the humans reach the big vehicle on the firmament of the god. That's why these stupas are not empty. 
in every stupa, the young Buddha, Buddha is sitting. What is he doing here? He's sitting there, he, he, he uses his hands, symbolically. He thinks he's in the small vehicle, which brings him up to the firmament, in the, to the big vehicle of the God. Now use a little imagination. Stoop up. Red. And everything looks different. It's all a question of the spirit of time. So 50 years ago we had other explanations. Now we have this explanation and I have the feeling the modern explanation makes much more sense than yesterday's explanation. There is another point which really nerves me on this planet. And this point is Natska. You all know Natska. Natska is a desert in Peru. It's about 500 kilometers south of Lima, the capital of Peru. When you fly over Natska, you see some strange lines. The locals, they differentiate between the lines. They call it uh, uh, las líneas, the small ones, and the large ones. The largest of the lines, the longest of the line, is 3.8 kilometers long. Then there are small lines, very small ones, not comparable to this one. They look like airstrips. They are not airstrips, but they look like airstrips. The longest of the small lines here are 23 kilometers long. And in the midst of these lines, you have figures, figures of fishes, monkeys, spiders, flowers, all kinds of figures. Now what nerves me, whenever on television they speak about Nazca, they never show you these pictures. They explain you, well, Nazca is a desert, and then you see some archaeologists scratching away the surface. On the desert you have brown, little brown stones. They scratch it away just with your shoes. And then you realize there's a bright shining surface coming out of the dark, which is true. And of course you can crash it away and you can make figures. No, no problem. But they do not show you these pictures. They just show you the figures. And these are the mystery. You see the mountains nearby. Normal mountains, they come together from both sides to the mountain top. Here we have some mountains where the top is cut off completely. Yeah. You see, that's a normal mountain here. Normal mountain, but not this one. And under them, you see something like an airstrip. Under it, something like a zigzag line. You never see it on television. All they tell you are these figures of fishes, monkeys, spiders, and all that little thing. I'd like to show you about 20 pictures about Nazca, which are simply incredible. Come on, Vito. This is Nazca. Ever seen this on television or in a book? I made these pictures some 20 years ago in the early morning. We made them by helicopters. I was sitting in a helicopter. This is Natska. In the meantime, since Natska is known, there are at least 20 different archaeological explanations. I learned Natska was an astronomical calendar. Another one said, no, it was a cult for the water gods. Look at this picture. There are four of these, one, two, three, four lines. The next one said, no, it was a cult for the mountain gods. Then I read, it's a cult for agriculture. In another book, I learn it was a pre-Inca sport place, some sort of pre-Inca Olympia. Others said, it's copies of Fata Morganas, a start place for hot air balloons, acaplodes, boundary makers, procession streets, Maps, a cultural atlas. Is this a cultural atlas? Have you ever seen these pictures on television? No. They lie at us with the pictures. They don't want 
that the large public see these pictures because we should, should start to think again. This is Natska, a cultural atlas. Natska is still a mystery today. We have no explanation. Of course, I have my suggestion. I, by the way, never said that Natska was the landing place for extraterrestrial spaceships. All through, I'm quoted always on television, on, on, on newspapers we did. This is Eric von Denik, the landing place for extraterrestrials. The spaceport of extra. That, that was never my idea. I wrote in Chariots of the Gods and in later book that it was a cult. But the cult had to do with extraterrestrials. This is true. I could imagine, and I know it from the old literature, that there is a mother spaceship which is for hundreds and hundreds of years on the way. The mother spaceship surrounds the Earth. They make measurements because of a long, after a long trip, they need raw material, they need energy. We have no idea what kind of energy. Something, maybe uranium, whatever. They make measurements and they realize they're Natska Desert. Natska still today is a big part for minery. And they were no humans. So they said, okay, we sent down just an automatic probe, something like a satellite. Of course, there's nobody there who makes an airline for them. The probe comes down, maybe in the, the, the last 20 meter, they use something like an air cushioning. Now stone and, and, and sand is blown away until this machinery comes to a st standstill. They make exact measurements. They go back up to the mother spaceship. Maybe two or three natives have seen this space probe coming down here, they could not understand it. Now the natives come on the desert and they see a little line, just a little line with blown away stones and sand. And now they go back to their tribe and say, this was coming from the sky, from the firmament, from the gods. They left this here. The natives think that the gods want some lines. And now the natives start to make lines. Large ones, small ones, lines in all directions, thick ones, and so on. They all believe that the gods want this. After some generation, a priest may have a good idea. They always have good ideas and says, uh, we must show them that we have offerings for them. Now they start to make figures in the midst of the lines, figures of monkeys, spiders, fishes, all kind of thing. That was my idea of Natska, and not it was the spaceport for extraterrestrials. Anyhow, the pictures you saw before, that's why I show it here, are never shown in public. And that's what nerves me here. What is going on on this planet? The same thing happened according to the Great Pyramid. <coughs> of course, this uh, is an object of controversy. There are many, many theories, and practically every year I receive another theory, mostly by engineers, by brilliant people. And every theory makes sense. But the fact is, we really don't know which theory is complete, correct. What have they done? The normal way of explanation is that the natives, 2500 BC, they constructed the ramp. Now the pyramid is four kilometers away from the Nile. So the ramp becomes higher and higher and higher. The ramp finally has more volume than the pyramid itself. You need more stones for the ramp than you need for the pyramid. Even if you make a ramp around the pyramid, it doesn't change. It has more volume than the pyramid itself. All this is possible. You can move the stone blocks by this. But never forget, in every technology, there is an evolution. Our Stone Age people first had to learn how to move the stone blocks, how you can do it. But Cheops, the builder of this pyramid, his father Snorfu, came right out from Stone Age. Where is the time, the evolution of technology to test all these different possibilities? Of course, you can do it in that way, but the evolution of technology speaks against it. Stone Age time. Now, in the meantime, we know a, more, a few more things about the Great Pyramid. The oldest god, of the Egyptian was Osiris. Osiris is the same thing as the star of Orion. Isis, the lady of Osiris, is the same in the star in the firmament of Sirius. 
So Orion and Sirius are in Egyptian mythology put together. In the meantime, we know that the three main pyramids have the shape of the Orion star belt. You know, inside there are different shafts. The shafts point directly to the star, the belt of Orion, and to Sirius. So Osiris and Isis up there. In our solar system, we have three inner planets. Inner planets means in the center is the sun, then comes Mercury, Venus, the Earth, the three inner planets. Inside the Great Pyramid, you have three inner rooms. And you see the distances between the three inner rooms are not equal, they are different. They are the same distances as the distances of the three inner planets. The Great Pyramid is not standing just by coincidence somewhere. The distance to the North Pole is the same as the distance to the center of the Earth. Now these are only a few curiosity, but they all do exist, of course. Now we have questions. If this is not coincidence, how did they know it? They could know nothing, nothing about Mercury. They did not know Mercury at their time. So the distance between Mercury, Venus and the Earth. If somebody told them, again, why? Thousands of years ago, the pyramid was not looking like this. The pyramid was covered with stone plates. Some of them are here, still here. It was all covered. There was no entry. And then came the Caliph Al-Mamun. It was 829 BC. And he simply made a hole into the pyramid. The real entry would have been up there. He could not find it. That was pure coincidence later that they found there. Now, in the Great Pyramid, you have different rooms. Today, they call the upper room, they call the, the king's chamber, the lower room, the queen's chamber, and under the pyramid is another room called the unfinished chamber. This is the so-called upgoing stairway. It's 23 meters high, only roughly one meters high. So 23 meters long, roughly one meter high. You have to go down on your knees. <coughs> then comes the so-called Great Gallery. At the end of the Great Gallery is the King's Chamber. Down here is the Queen's Chamber. It looks like this, the upcoming shaft, then the Great Gallery, King's Chamber, Queen's Chamber. Now I'm going into the Queen's Chamber because there is a hole in the wall. And this picture I show you because I want to, that you compare my hand, my finger, with the longitude of this, it's about 14 centimeter. Now you have to know, this is very important, that this hole exists only since 160 years. Before 160 years, there was no hole in the wall. In, in the wall. By the way, the same thing happened on the, up, on the other side. This is the south side, it's got a shy stem here. This is the south side, and this is the other side here. Only since 160 years, why? 160 years ago, Again, a British engineer, his name was Mr. Nixon, came to the pyramid. Of course, he was looking for new rooms. He hoped that he will find some treasures. And he had a little hammer. And he knocked on the wall every few centimeters. And on the top side, it sounded hollow. Here, this is the south side, and on the upper side. And only now, he opened the wall. In archaeology, they were absolutely sure that these two shafts here are only two meters long. They are called symbolic shafts. Then a friend of mine, a German engineer, came, Rudolf Gantenbrink, and he constructed a robot. The robot is composited out of steel. They put it six electromotors inside, halogen lamps, of course, video cameras, movable in every director. Rudolf Gantenbrink went to, went to the chief of antiquity, in Egypt, Professor Sai Havas at that time, and he said, I can go with this robot in the shaft. I can show you how long it is. They were against it. But finally, Sai Havas said, come on, let him do. He will find out that he's not right, that he's wrong. So the robot went into the shaft. The first two meter horizontal. Then they climb up inside. 
always the wall, the stones changed. It was sandstone, it was granite, it was alabaster, you will see it later. Always openings like doors. Now if you see these pictures, ladies and gentlemen, you may have the impression that this is a gigantic uh, way in there, a shaft. No, it's not. Remember my hand. It's only about 14 centimeters side length on one side. So you cannot climb in there. Not, not even a Lilliput man. So the robot climbed up inside the shaft. The two meters were passed, my God. And archaeologists were looking down at the monitor. They were sweeping and saying, what's going on here? This is alabaster, by the way. Then they found scratches in different forms inside the shaft. It looks as if some thousands of years ago, something was pushed through the shaft here and left some traces behind. The robot continued his climbing inside and on meter 32, a stone blocked the continuation here. The robot had to put out, it was too high, the robot, so they had to lower him, which they did. And five days later, he, the robot took this obstacle and continued his trip. This was meter uh, uh, 32 inside the Great Pyramid, always slowly going up and up. So the robot continued, the walls were alabaster, absolutely polished, and finally they came to a sort of door with two bracelets. One of them was falling down, but it was not found on the right side, on the left side, but on the, on the right side, you will see it here. Now for the next pictures, please watch exactly the laser not my laser, this laser point here, the red dot. It goes under the door. So we knew that there must be a continuation behind it. All this is about 20 years, 25 years old. You have certainly heard about in, in, in the television or in the medias here. The question is what happened since then? You hear nothing of the continuation. That's why I bring up this case again. Eight years later, uh, the American National Geographic Society came up with the new robot. The new robot had the possibility to make a hole, to dig a hole into this door. Bring this to you, Melendly. Yeah. So, they made a worldwide TV show, live to the world public, and said for the first time, they will now put the camera through the hole. It was all a lie. They had put the cameras three weeks before already through the hole. They knew exactly that behind the door there is nothing. If there would have been something sensational, they would have never shown it to the public. We are told lies. Anyhow, we had this hole now in this little door and 23 centimeters behind it was this wall. And you see the wall is broken somehow. So another 12 years later, a rich man from Singapore arrived. And he said to the Department of Antiquity in Cairo, he has a new robot. And this new robot could destroy this wall simply by vibration. But the Department of uh, Antiquity said, no, no possibility. We will not give you the permission. The only permission you have is to make a very, very small hole, not bigger than for an endoscope. With an endoscope, you go into your stomach. Now, the hole was in the first door, and the wall is 23 and a half centimeter behind it. So you need a, a long digging machine, which they did. They made a small hole. They put an endoscope through it. The endoscope doesn't make big figures, big pictures, just small pictures, but hundreds of them. The computer puts them together in the right way. And what's behind it? Another room. <laughs> there is something we don't know. Is it painting or writing, whatever it is? But definitely it's not hieroglyphs. Now we have another question. You see, 
Archaeology is sure that the Great Pyramid was constructed by a pharaoh with the name of Cheops. Cheops was roughly 2400 BC, 4th dynasty. But Cheops is called a tyrant. Tyrants, they all are, are, are dictators. Normally, if Cheops would have constructed the Great Pyramid, the pyramid should be full with inscriptions. I am the one, I am the greatest, I did it. But in the Great Pyramid, there is not one single inscription. Nothing. Not when hieroglyph. The total anonymity. It doesn't fit together with Cheops. Now, old Arabian historians, I mean, Ibrahim Abdul al Masudi, al Makritsi, all these people living thousands of years ago, they said the Great Pyramid was constructed before the Great Flood by a ruler, his name was Saurit. And they precisely say, Saurit is the same figure which the Hebrew community call Enoch. Do you remember Enoch? He was teached by the extraterrestrials. Enoch learned the language of them. As soon as you know the language, one of the teachers says to Enoch, human, look out of the window. You see this little light there? You humans, you call it moon. But the moon has no light by itself. The moon receives his light from the sun, and he explains him the different phases of the moon. The stranger says to Enoch, you see this big shining light up there? You humans, you call it sun. But look at all the other little lights there. They are all suns. Around the suns surround planets. Planets, your planet, the Earth surround your sun in 365 days, plus not only uh, leak years, but leak hours. So. I know, of course, that our ancestors in the Stone Age time, they were afraid of nature. They were afraid of the earthquakening. They were afraid of the lightning, of the thundering. They could not understand these things. So the first religion on our planet were natural religions. Of course, what else? But this is not the same. The teachers, the extraterrestrials, give information, scientific information. An earthquake or the sun does not say to the human, you see this little light out there? You humans call it moon. The moon has no light by itself. The moon receives its light from the sun and explains the different phases of the moon. Why is the moon sometimes full, half, why is it disappeared, etc. This means scientific information coming from up down to the humans. And that's the difference between natural religi religion. Now here, Enoch, according to all traditions, should be, and his son Methuselah, the builder of the Great Pyramid. I told you Enoch disappeared in a fiery chariot before he went away. He went back to the earth one day to, to say goodbye to his family. His oldest son was Methuselah. And Enoch said to his son Methuselah, and now my son, I give you all these books written by your father's hand. Keep them carefully for the generations after the Great Flood, because this was before the Great Flood. Where are the books of Enoch? The only one we have, the one is from Ethiopia. But Enoch gave to his son over 100 books. Sooner or later, we will find some rooms in the pyramid with the books of Enoch. And there are other strange mysteries in this building, not known to the public. There is a room under the pyramid. In archaeology, it's called the unfinished chamber. The tourists go to this main entrance. Then you have a crossing. You can cross upway to the so-called Great Gallery, or you can go down. But the tourists are never allowed to go down because this shaft goes deep under the planet. The shaft is 119 meters long, quite a distance. Then you come to an unfinished room. It was discovered in the year 827 AD in our time by the Caliph Al-Mamun. He was the first who opened the pyramid. Al-Khalif Al-Mamun said that in a shaft here, which you just will see, he found four doors with four different rooms. In one room, he found metals, very thin metals, which do not rust. In another room, he found uh, uh, mummified beings with long head, elongated heads. And there were writings, but he 
and his scientists at his time could not decipher the writings, which means it is not Enoch, it is not Cheops time. Now Al Mamun said that he himself gave order to change everything down here so that no one after him would ever found these rooms again. I was down there many times. I was also knocking on the wall with the little hammer, and you have no chance. You cannot find anyhow nothing. But the mysteries continue. About 2500 BC, Herodotus, the Greek historian, was here. And he said, under the Great Pyramid is a sea, a lake. And in the lake, covered by water, is a sarcophagus. In Egyptology, we always said, this is rubbish. There cannot be a lake under the pyramid. In the meantime, this lake was found. You crap, crap down. There are two uh, steps in the meantime, ladders. You go down here, uh, 26 meter. The shaft is so large that there are two letters, one next to each other. You came to a room down in the chiseling, and there are seven niches cut out of the rock, but only in two niches are sarcophaguses. This one is black basalt, means volcanic rock. Another one is granite. They told me there was nothing in there when they found it. I'm not sure if this is true. Now from this point, we go deeper. Before you just saw a shaft which was large enough for two ladders. The continuation is not the same, not the same shaft, there's only one ladder going down there. And then you closer come with every step under the Great Pyramid. And there is a lake. And in the lake, a sarcophagus, covered by water, exactly as Herodotus told us two and a half thousand years ago. You see it here? Now these wooden blocks, wooden trees are from our time because they opened the sarcophagus. Again here they told me they found nothing in a, inside. If it's true, I have no way to. Here's the sarcophagus, covered by water. Absolutely clear water. Now in antiquity, before these extraterrestrial ethnologists left the, left the earth, they promised to our forefathers that they will return one day. And this return went into the mythology and into the belief of every community. In the past, when for example, Francisco Pizarro, Pizarro was the conqueror, the Spanish conqueror who conquered today's Peru. When he came to the coast, the natives believed that he is the long awaited God. They fell down on their knees. The same thing, for example, with uh, Hernando Cortes. He was the one who conquered Mexico. The, the, the king was Moctezuma, the king of the Aztecs. Even the king believed that Hernando Cortes is the long awaited God. Or James Cook in the South Sea. All the same thing. Whenever the first contact was made with natives worldwide, they always were already expect, expected. The natives always believed that these are the long awaited gods. So I want to make clear this uh, expectation of returning of somebody is not a Christian invention. This is much older than Christianity. And what do we have today? I'm educated as a Catholic and uh, we learned that one day Jesus will return. But the Muslim society believes the same. They believe that one day their Mahdi will return. As we all know, the Jewish community believes the same. They are sure that their Messiah will return. Every religion, still living religion of today, has their belief of the return of somebody from up there. Now, honestly, not every religion can be right. Some of them must be wrong. I think this promise of return was given by the extraterrestrials a long time ago, and they will return. I have to clarify two little things. The critics always say, Mr. von Däniken does obviously not know that the distances between the stars are measured in light years, and these distances are so terribly high, nobody can reach light years. I'm sorry, this is not true. We have a primitive way to do it. Everyone knows the American Space Shuttle. With every shot, you have a heavy load of uh, 
roundly, roughly 30 uh, tons. Prefabricated objects shut up between the Earth and the Moon. You connect them, you put them together to a gigantic wheel. It has to be a wheel. Soon as the wheel turns around its own axis, you have a centrifugal force, which means artificial gravity. And then you start this wheel very, very slowly. It might take 100 years in acceleration before you reach only 2% of the speed of light. But 2% of the speed of light, you would reach the distance of 10 light years within 500 human years. Now you may say, this is impossible. Nobody will survive it. Will survive it. You don't have to survive it. Just look at this as a generation spaceship. There are many generations on board. Oh, yes, there are British restaurants, Swiss cheese fondue, Greek restaurants up there, television, sports, whatever. Maybe it takes 26 generations before you reach the center. Until some years ago, we have learned that the Earth has a unique position in the universe. We are not too close to the sun, not too hot, not too far away, not too cold, etc. In the meantime, grace to Hubble telescope and other technologies, we know that our Milky Way is full of Earth-like planets. NASA suggested only in our, our Milky Way, we must have about 4.5 billions of Earth-like planets. So they on the way, they will find out which sun has Earth-like planets in the correct distances. Now they give the, the crew 500 years to construct a new spaceship. Now, they were 500 years on the way. They have other 500 years to make the evolution, the industries, to construct a new spaceship. And now it starts to be interesting. From the Earth, a spaceship started 500 years on the way. After a stop of 500 years, there are two, the old one and the new one. Each one has 500 years again, and then are four, and six, and 32, etc. Now a snowball system starts to work with the speed of only 2% of the speed of light, you would colonize our whole Milky Way in 10 millions of years, starting from one point. And all what the Earthlings had to do is to construct the first spaceship. Now, I made this calculation with 2% of the speed of light. If we calculate 10% of the speed of light, it will not take 10 millions, only 2 millions or so. So always what I read in science, it is impossible to reach the distance between the star. I'm sorry, it's not true. Why should extraterrestrials be similar to us? I said, Enoch, the ethnologists, or in the Bible, they had sex with humans. Normal evolution goes in a way that on other planets, complete different beings evolve. I can imagine flying elephants or whatever. But there is a theory, which is not from me, it's from the Swedish Nobel Prize winner, Savante Arrhenius, he's dead since 70 years. The theory is called panspermia. It goes like this. Somewhere in our Milky Way, the first intelligent form of life appeared. Now we can cry, stop. How did it start at this? Give me a piece of paper. And I make a perfect circle. Then I give this piece of paper back to you. It goes from hand to hand. And I ask you the question, what did the circle start? Your logic says, well, Mr. Van Däniken must have started somewhere. But you cannot give an answer because the circle is closed in, in, in itself. In astrophysics, they say in the beginning was the Big Bang. Okay, what started the Big Bang? Or in religion or philosophy, we say in the beginning was God. And what started God? We have no answer, neither in philosophy nor in science. So just somewhere it started. The first intelligent form of life had a wish to spread out their own form of life in a certain part of their Milky Way. Now, they do not send spaceships out there. They simply infect a section of their Milky Way with spores of life. Make this, and now because of your hand, you're rubbling, you have a 10 thousands of cells. In each and every cell, you have the DNA. In the DNA, you have the copy of your body, not only of your body, including your ancestor. So you infect a section of a Milky Way with DNA. Of course, you know exactly, it's like dust, that the biggest part of this will come into the gravity of a sun, will die. Another part will come to the gravity of planets which are not, cannot support this form of life, like Jupiter. A small part of it will make a landing in the gravity of a planet which is similar than the one who started. 
And now life starts on this planet. I have learned in school that it all started on Earth with this primordial soup. Some atoms come together and form molecules, etc. In the meantime, modern science says no. The information of life came from outside. And funny enough, that information, that modern information, you can also find in the old holy writings. I mean, in this section here, you, you know only the Bible. And God, or the gods, created humans according their own image. If you look at it this way, we are the offsprings. And that's why they could have had sex with us. We are the same family. And that's why they promised they will return. And one day they will return. And sometimes I have the feeling we are already under observation. All these past decades, I was never a believer in UFO. I was a rather a skeptic in UFO. There was too much rubbish on the field. But I had to change my opinion slowly and slowly. And to finish this speech, I like to show you a UFO film which you cannot falsificate. I have received this film from an air fighter pilot, an American pilot. He wrote me that he made the film on April 20th, 2013, on the airport Hernandez near Aguadilla. This is in Puerto Rico. Now, in the fighter airport, you have a camera. The camera is fixed. You cannot move the camera. You cannot take the camera in your hand. And you see on screen, every message has all the dates which change every second. What dates? How, what is the speed of the aircraft? How high is it from the ground? Uh, how far away is, is the other aircraft, etc.? What is the exact geographical location? That's why you cannot falsify it. You see the dates change, down, change always. Now the object comes up here. The pilot wrote me sometimes uh, it was faster and then a little slower. Sometimes it even changed their shape. The object was first flying over fields, farmer houses, then over the airport, Aguadilla. They stopped every flight, air control, for two and a half hours. Then came uh, the harbor, and you will see the ob object jumps into the water. It's real, it's not fiction. You just see the water springing up. And after a few seconds, it comes out of the water, but all of a sudden, it's too objects, two separate objects. And don't forget the dates, who change always. Now it's in the water. Huh. Now we have two. We have no such technology on Earth. Is somebody observing us, learning our languages, Will they be returned and without a shock? In this country here, you are full of what you call crop circles. Of course, we know so many crop circles are falsificates. We know how they do it and who they are, etc. But there are other crop circles which appear within minutes. Absolutely fantastic. They are filmed with some little lights are there. What is going on? I have the impression that somebody tries to educate us slowly so that we are not shocked. They make these pictures, they show up like a UFO, they want that we discuss about it. Not to shock us, slowly. This humanity should start to think about it. The time is ripe that we translate the old text in a modern version. At the same time, the time is ripe that we find some new shafts in the Great Pyramid, that we find some books of Enoch that we start to analyze these UFOs in a modern way, that we start to find the proof for these crop circles. And all this, ladies and gentlemen, what I do has nothing to do with the new religion. You have to believe nothing. I turn myself in a tomb if some idiots come up and make out of my theory some sort of sect. That will be the last thing I want. So why do I make my speeches and I write my books? I wish that we think about all these things. 
that we maybe came to another conclusion than we had before. And that will change the spirit of time. And then we are prepared for a possible visit, a return of the extraterrestrials. And we have no shock, no catastrophe. We have just peace. That's why I'm doing my job. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a few things I want to say before I just finish. Somewhere in this room is Vitaly Safarov and his team, and he organized all this. I'm very, very happy and very thankful to Vitaly that you did this job. Of course, to Norbert Reichert, the Zohar Entertainment Group, and all the helpers who made it possible that after more or less 30 years, I had a chance to come back to England again and to give this speech. And I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, that you have come here this evening and that you have been listening so quiet to this controversial Swiss, Eric von Däniken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. After his electrifying presentation, Richard invited Eric to discuss some of his accomplishments and the influence that his work has generated in the areas of science, literature and contemporary art. Let's take a look. Let's show our appreciation one more time. Ah, come on. Ah, thank you. Eric, uh, you said 25, 30 years since you made your last presentation. Some of the people in this audience tonight brought their children, and those children have brought their children tonight. Oh. What do you make of that? How about that? Well, uh, in my archive, I have about 200,000 pictures. 200,000. It's the work of my life. And in reality, that was one speech I give here. I have at least 20 different speeches with different pictures to support the case. So we have mm. the chance to invite me again. Sooner or later, England. <laughs> Another 25 years, yeah. no doubt. Eric, your, your body of work, it, it, it does speak for itself. 40 publications, 32 languages, 70 million books sold so far. And uh, what's special about tonight is that it was in this very city in 69 that uh, Britain's only major independent publisher, Souvenir Press, uh, took a leap of faith and published Chariots of the Gods. I look at this newest book which will be on the British market sooner or later. I look at it as the continuation of Chariots of the Gods. As I said before, the spirit of time has changed, the return of the gods, the crop circle, all these things. I have uh, had so many discussions with, with well-educated and intelligent personalities on this planet concerning the crop circle, the UFOs and all this. And they all, in the meantime, admit high persons from NASA, from the French uh, scientific group, etc., they all accept in, in the meantime, we are on the observation. The public doesn't know it. And so the newest book has to do with these kind of things. What is going on? Do we have to be afraid? Are we shocked? Is somebody there to kill us, to destroy us? Nothing of all this will happen. They know exactly how we function because we are the offsprings of them. They know how our brain works. So they will not harm us, not kill us, kill us but they slowly won that we are prepared for this return. It was 1968 when Chariots of the Gods was eventually printed in Germany. However, the journey of its creator began many years before when the young Eric von Daniken joined College Saint Michel, a strict Catholic boarding school established by Jesuit priest St. Peter Canisius. It was at this time that he began to challenge the religious values of the world that he was growing up in. We have a little surprise for you that uh, the college. Earlier this year, we met with a, a fellow student um, called Marius Cotier. Oh, okay. And an exceptional gentleman who went on to become a prominent Swiss politician, ladies and gentlemen. Should we have a look at what Marius Cotier has to say? Eric, come down so Eric came around the second or third year after I was here and he immediately took his place. An alpha animal as we know him. 
but he was also very socially competent and open, curious. Eric was very interested in God and the unknown, in the heavens. Discussions with him were often about religion, but he never found an answer that satisfied him. Yes, I can still remember the first book Eric published quite well. Back then he was in Bern when he wrote Chariots of the Gods. Wow, I thought that it was at times great and Eric was in his element and was himself, as he was in his life. Loyal, curious, always researching and going on. It was something we did not expect, to have someone in our class that started writing books and that he had success doing it. So it was an unexpected surprise for us all. And he had so much success that we admired him. This colleague was strictly Catholic, led by Jesuit. Yes. And uh, of course I had my, reli my religious doubts. We had to translate part of the Bible from one language to the other, Latin to Greek, Greek to German. I had my doubts. I simply wanted to find out if other communities in antiquity have similar stories as we have them in the Bible and so. And these professors at the college in, in Fribourg, they were very, very correct and very, very nice. They were absolutely not against it or in controversy. They said, okay, Eric, learn this and this. Go to the university, to the library, find this and this. So they were very, very helpful. Eric graduated from College Saint-Michel and began the extraordinary voyage that shaped his stormy personal life and contributed to his exciting professional career. Through fate and coincidence, Eric's hypotheses and discoveries brought him to the attention of influential scientific and science fiction luminaries whose guiding light contributed to the creation of Chariots of the Gods. Your first manuscripts, I believe, were rejected 25 yeah. times. Now, within a year, they had to republish 30 times, and then it got translated into multiple languages. Now, tell us how you felt when you'd realized you'd overcome that rejection and the world had taken to you. You see, from my education after the college, I came, my family, I came from the hotel business, so which is normal in Switzerland. So I was a, a, a student in the hotel school. I was, of course, for a short time a waiter. I was a barkeeper. I was a cook. I was a receptionist. I did everything. And when I wrote Chariots of the Guards, I was the managing director of a first-class hotel in Switzerland. Amazing. So uh, as a managing director, I wrote Chariots of the Guards. Yeah. And uh, I said... You weren't said, very busy then in yeah. the hotel, no? I <laughs> sent it to 25 German publishers. They all rejected it. Uh -huh. And finally, I had the help of uh, somebody. And finally, Chariots of the Guards come on the German market. And then in England, as we said, Ernest well. Hecht did it. I was always knowing that I was sitting on a kind of volcano. But I was thinking only in German language. You know, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany. I was never prepared that this would be a worldwide uh, event, a worldwide success. In the meantime, I, of course, I learned a lot, and I learned to, de to defend myself, and I learned also to accept critics, because when you are young, you are stubborn, yeah. you are self-believer, you uh, think you are right all the time. Later you learn that the critics may well be right, at so many other points. I know you have a word for critics, maybe we'll hear it later. Um, <laughs> I don't think we realize the, the volume of work that in perspective will astound you. And it gave birth to a new era of literature, TV, and documentaries. Let us see how that body of work looks like on the screen. The 
43rd Annual Academy Award Show. The nominations for the best achievement in production of documentary features are Chariots of the Gods, Dr. Harold Reiner, producer. For Jahrtausenden kamen sie aus den unmöglichen Weiten des Universums. Bewohner fremder Galaxien landeten auf unserem Planeten. Deshalb waren sie hier. Sie kamen als Pioniere und Götter der Zukunft. Und bis heute sind ihre Spuren auf der Erde verewigt. Eric, you're, you're still at it, and that's not all. That was, that was just part of it. Oh. I mean, how about other inspirations? I mean, by the way, you're responsible for a lot of films that a lot of people have been to see, uh, from Spielberg to George Lucas. As you can see, Eric's work has become an iconic source of inspiration. Even today, his work captivates and excites creative minds. I am what I am. Some know me, never mind the others. This is the motto that Eric has adopted throughout his career, particularly when dealing with his critics. I said before, in the meantime, I love critics. I, I love them. I love the discussions with critics because they have good arguments and I have good arguments. And I simply learned when we sit together and when we are not lying to each other, when we are not bluffing and not trying to, to tell stories which are not true, when each one listened to the other, both parties learn. I always learn from the critic, from academic, science, archaeologists, but the other side also, at the end of long discussions, they always told to me, Eric, we didn't know about this. We didn't know about these old texts. We didn't know about these experiences. So everyone has his knowledge, so we should share it in a friendly and academic way. Yeah. Well, that was a very polite uh, uh, response to your critics. <laughs> so, um, you know, in 96, you formed a foundation. You talked about it earlier, 300,000 slides, ancient sites, films, manuscripts, photographs, reports from your extensive body of work. Now, that makes the foundation the world's largest keeper of paleo SETI-related material. My name is Ramon Zürcher. I'm the personal assistant of Eric van Daniken since over 10 years now. I'm really proud to be in this position, to have the opportunity to manage all requests to Eric. Here in the office, we are working for three different parties. Eric von Daniken as author and personnel. Then we have the Eric von Daniken Foundation, which is in due to a finance a research program, interdisciplinary research programs. And we host also um, our research organization, which is called AAS, Ancient Astronaut Society. And every two months, since over 40 years, we publish this magazine, which is called Sagenhafte Zeiten in Germany, it means legendary times. We have about 300,000 pictures, um, positives as slides, as negatives, which are showing all the different places all over the world which were relevant for Eric's studies and researches. For the past 10 years, I, one of my jobs was um, digitalizing all the archive to, to get the original colors back from the old pictures. 
That's my biggest pride, uh, to conserve uh, all this um, material for Eric von Däniken's legacy. Gradually, over the years, Eric's work has gained a growing recognition and acceptance with scientific and theological bodies. Many luminaries have referred to the significance of Eric's work. Joseph Blumrich, in the preface to his 1974 book, The Spaceships of Ezekiel, wrote, The emergence of this book is a consequence of reading Eric von Däniken's Chariots of the Gods. The eminent British astrophysicist Sir Fred Hoyle, together with Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe, a pioneering astrobiologist, suggested that, in reality, mutations came from intelligent life forms in space. Eric von Däniken proposed the same ideas in his 1977 publication, According to the Evidence. For this special occasion, Professor Vikramasinghe now a visiting by fellow scholar at Churchill College, Cambridge, has this to say. Fifty years ago, when I read Chariots of the Gods, I was amazed at the content of it. Uh, I don't really think that at the time I believed everything that was written on it, but it was exciting, it was challenging, and I found it uh, really very stimulating. Now, fifty years ago, the scientific community was loggerheads with Eric and with anybody who would uh, dare to champion an idea like that, uh, like the Chariots of the Gods, where extraterrestrial life has uh, interacted in some profound way with her planet. Uh, so I think the, 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 the evidence, the scientific evidence is moving in the direction of accepting a lot of what Eric has said in his book. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's amazing that 50 years on, this is science, what was thought to be heresy or even science fiction by many people, are turning, is turning out to be science fact. Throughout Eric von Däniken's illustrious career, he has been honored numerous times for his continued research in discovering and popularizing the cultural heritage of mankind and for his lifetime mission towards unraveling the unsolved mysteries of the past. His invaluable body of work has influenced many of today's leading ambassadors of truth and he continues to signpost the way for new generations of dedicated and curious researchers. I remember reading that book when I was 17 or 18 years old. It mesmerized me about possibilities of life out there. And when Eric did his research about those Nazca lines in Peru that you could only decipher and see from above, I looked at those pictures and I was just amazed. I was riveted by it. And it was one of the main reasons, that book, Chariots of the Gods, that pushed me into the field of broadcasting. That book changed many people's lives, and it changed mine, too. I was just in high school when I read Chariots of the Gods, and then I re read Return to the Stars, and then I spent all my hard-earned money at the grocery store buying Gold of the Gods, and I read all your books, and I was inspired by your books and you to travel all over the world and see all these places myself. Eric, this is Don Schmidt of Roswell, New Mexico fame. I want to wish you all the best on this special occasion. You're certainly one of my inspirations, and even as a young teenage boy, the very thought that not only were we visited in 1947 with the crash at Roswell, but that it's been going on for many centuries before. I'm here to tell you that I don't think I would have done anything that I've done. I don't think I would have written Fingerprints of the Gods. If it hadn't been for the encouragement to ask questions about the past that your book gave me at a very important stage of my life, and that's what I truly value about you, Eric. I, I don't agree with you on everything you say, but I think you've had a profound impact by leading an entire generation to ask questions. I was just out of college. There was something that said to me that I was holding the truth it was a truth that the rest of the planet did not know, 
and I had no idea how much the rest of my professional life would resonate with the whole concept that an alien presence has been on this earth for a very long time, and Eric had the guts to put it into print first, and it has become one of the greatest books on earth. Chinese of the Gods to me was the, uh, the catalyst that got me to ask the big questions and finally led me to uh, develop my own uh, research into the uh, pyramids of Egypt and the Orion correlations. Much, much to your credit, you know, you've inspired uh, many researchers to follow in your uh, footsteps, finding things that uh, the uh, mainstream archaeologists uh, just overlooked, I suppose. Thank you. Okay. Very impressive. For, for everything you've achieved and yet to accomplish, your close friend and fellow researcher best known for his appearance on the highly successful TV series, Ancient Aliens, is here tonight to present you our very own Stellar Citizen Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the one and only Mr. Giorgio Soukalos. Eric, what a great honor and privilege it is for me to stand here and to hand you this award, the Stellar Citizen Award, because as you've seen, you have changed people's lives, including mine. When I was a little boy, I was reading your books. My grandmother would sometimes read passages out of your work. And I was five, six, seven years old. I didn't know what was going on but she planted the seed. And uh, to be here today in this, for this occasion is one of the biggest honors and privileges I've had to encounter in my life. And I would like to thank you very much for everything. I would like to thank you for having taken me underneath your wing and um, have shown me how the world really could be because in the end, all the solutions to our questions are rather simple. And for that, for having been my teacher, I would like to thank you um, for that great privilege. And with this, I would like to present this award to Eric, which is the Stellar Citizen Award, and it's the first of its kind. And it is for people who have changed the world. And this is something that Eric has done. I think we can all agree with that. So for that, I would like to express my appreciation for Mr. Van Daniken. The Earth's crust was formed about four billion years ago. And all that science knows is that something like man existed one million years ago. And out of that gigantic river of time, it has managed to dam up only a tiny rivulet of 7,000 years of human history. Chariots of the God. The international bestseller by Eric Von Daniken that shattered conventional theories about history and archaeology. Chariots of the Gods explores Von Daniken's controversial and explosive theory that beings from other galaxies visited Earth in ancient times. In a genius Please stay with us as we continue the celebration of Eric's career.
ihre Botschaften, denn wir wissen, sie kehren wieder.
Georgia, what brings you to the UK at this moment? Well, I'm here to celebrate uh, Eric von Ennick's legacy, which takes place tomorrow night, uh, October 15th at the Bafta Theatre, Princess Anne, and uh, looking forward to celebrate uh, this magnificent man's life at this e event, and we're here at the Watkins Publishing right now, at the Watkins Bookstore, and it's a, a great privilege to you be here. David, what brought you here? Well, I came with friends, but uh, I've always had a fascination uh, with Eric von Däniken since I was a teenager. Can you tell us about the story? Well, I'm now a professor of surgery in the UK, and uh, with that comes a lot of science and a lot of questioning. Uh, when I was a young lad, I was 14 or 15 years of age, I was given this book, and which is now signed for me, thank you. But. It made me question everything. So he does, whether you believe the book or you don't believe the contents, it makes you question everything. And that's a very good for a young, a young man growing up, a scientist. It still pushes you to question everything. And I think it's very good for that to, to bring back determination and a curiosity of life. Are you thankful for Eric to oh, it's, it's fantastic. I've thought about him nearly every year. And every time I challenge things, if, if I'm running a meeting, or I get young scientists, I will quote this book and I'll say whether you believe it, it doesn't matter. You need to question, learn, look things up, go out and explore. And it's all because of this guy. He's fantastic. Jamie, what brought you here? How, what, what do you expect from Martin Evening? Um, well, this is my father. It's Gary Heseltine and he runs UFO Truth magazine and the UFO uh, conferences in the UK. And he invited me as his guest. How do you feel after this evening about all those information? Wow! <laughs> well! <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty full on. A uh, pretty uh, phenomenal amount of investment into uh, something so wonderful as 
uh, explaining to the rest of humanity that there is uh, life on other planets and it visits here and perhaps we're from the stars ourselves. Did it change your uh, side of life? Uh, not really, because I'm already really on board with those kind of concepts because my dad's uh, body of work has introduced me to that. I've uh, long admired Eric von Daniken's work and as one of the uh, sponsors of this event, uh, it was finally great to see him in action. Uh, I remember, like he said as a child, and so many others have, that buying chariots to the gods in 1976 inspired me to get involved in UFO research and I now uh, it's full-time job and I run a magazine and organize conferences so he has changed so many people and uh, I think this is a, a really glittering occasion that is well deserved. My name is Steve Merrer and I am part of the Zohar team that helped create this wonderful masterpiece that everybody's come to see tonight and celebrate Eric's 50th anniversary of Chariots of the Gods. What gave you the idea to create such an event? Well, we wanted to celebrate Eric's work, body of work. Eric's book itself was monumental. He absolutely deserved an event like this, nothing but nothing less than this. Uh, it's fantastic that we've got so many influential people here from the community, the UFO community, ancient mysteries, the paranormal, the supernatural, from all over the world that have come to see Eric and celebrate with him this 50th anniversary. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a fantastic show. How long does it took uh, to prepare everything? It's took a lot of work. It's taken about 12 months of constant work right through the early hours pushing into maybe 14 hours per day and sometimes but it's all down to the team nobody could have done it alone we have some fantastic and incredible uh, guys that have done the vision visual the sound the graphics and it's all come together one night and it's, it's just we, a wonderful team we couldn't we couldn't have done it with anybody's help when was the first time you met Eric uh, I met Eric many years ago I mean uh, 25 years ago I met Eric and this is my second time I've met Eric, and I'll be, I'll be lecturing alongside Eric in March of next year when he returns to Manchester. Did you get infected by his idea? Was it side of you immediately? As a very young child, my father was interested in the subject and, also, and had a collection of Eric Von Daniken books. And while my friends at school were reading comics and things, I was reading Eric Von Daniken books. And do you know, once I, start, once I read them, I was hooked. I had to read more. And I just went on and on. I thank heavens he, he produced so many books for the people like me to just read and absorb that information and learn. And, and when I got up at about 15, 16 years of age, I wanted to study the field a little, a little bit more. When I got into my 20s, I wanted to let people know, pass the word on, educate people. And that is what we're doing. This is, this is about letting the world know that there's, there's much more to see about this fantastic world we live in, the mysteries, and people need to ask questions. We need to learn. I think you have done this successfully tonight, so you must be very happy. I'm over the moon, you know, it was absolutely fantastic event, the visuals, the, the music, the music score itself was purposely wrote for this, event, uh, this, this fantastic occasion. And it, I'm so glad everything seemed to come together. I'm so glad to share the, the happiness with everybody, the whole team's here tonight, to celebrate what we've done, not just Eric's work, but the achievement of actually putting an event like this together.